But um, it, it's good to have you here today on, on this last Sunday of October. You know, Halloween is tomorrow. And I know that, you know, some people, they just, they just ignore the holiday. Others, they enjoy the festivities by dressing up and going out trick-or-treating. Some people will stay home and, you know, they'll just pass out candy. Still others, they enjoy the creepiness of the whole time. And they kind of do their best to make things scary and spooky and whatnot. For instance, some people, they're going to, you know, set up decorations with eerie lighting and, and spooky sound effects. That's scary. Uh, some people buy realistic looking masks, right, that, that maybe look like werewolves or dead people. And that's definitely scary. One year, Craig came to our trunk or treat with a ball cap that had hair on it and a ponytail. That was scary. I don't even recognize them. But, but uh, you know, some people, they enjoy watching scary movies, especially around this time of the year. Shows like the, the Walking Dead or The Shining or Bates Motel or Psycho or The Exorcist or Goosebumps or Monster House, you know. Some people are scared of clowns, right? Oh, the clowns. Uh, in fact, there have been clowns popping up all around the United States, including down at MSU, and they kind of started a big mob reaction. And down in Detroit, uh, they were scaring people. In some cases, it's been alleged that people dressed as clowns are trying to entice little kids with candy. That's definitely scary stuff. Some of these clowns that have been popping up around America, they scare us more than others. <coughs> <laughs> I know, that was a cheap laugh, right? But, uh, that wasn't nice, but it was funny. Um, if that doesn't scare you, nothing will, right? But, but I, I do hope that you will go out and vote on November the 8th. And in fact, uh, you know, make sure you're informed on, on the issues and where the candidates stand and whatnot. Uh, there, we set out some voter guides there. Uh, through Faith in Action that, that shows what they, where they stand on the issues. It doesn't tell you how to vote, but where they stand on the issues. And you can make up your own mind about that. But get out there and vote on November 8th. It's important. Now, <clears throat> as scary as all that stuff is that I just mentioned, perhaps one of the scariest things that could ever happen to you and me uh, involves our money. <clears throat> now, I want you to listen carefully. There is nothing scarier than not wanting to answer your phone because you are avoiding the bill collectors, right? There's nothing scarier than when you can't pay your mortgage and the bank forecloses on your house and you're wondering, where am I gonna live? Last December, right before Christmas, our neighbors who lived in their house, when we moved into our house, and that's going on 20 years now, all of a sudden they were moved out and gone. They had been foreclosed on a week before Christmas. It's scary <clears throat> when you lose your job and you don't know how you're going to pay for your food or your gas or your electric because you're already living paycheck to paycheck and there's no wiggle room financially for you to miss a paycheck now. It's scary when your car breaks down, right? And you have, you have to drive your car to work, but it's going to cost $600 to fix and now you have to choose between, do I buy groceries this week or do I get the car fixed this week? That's scary. It's scary when you have maxed out and run up your credit card, but not just the Visa and MasterCard. You know, you've also run up the Kohl's card and the Speedway card and the Ann Taylor card and the JCPenney and Sears cards and the K Jewelers card and any number of other retailer cards. Lord and Taylor, Macy's, Mark, Neiman Marcus, Zales. On top of that, there's the new car that you just bought, right? And the new phone and the new iPad. You get the picture. Everything's maxed out. You owe tens of thousands of dollars, and it's going to take you a decade to get unburied from all that. That, my friends, is scary. But what would you say if I told you today that you don't have to constantly live in fear of your finances? If you are open to having a new perspective about money and how to manage that with God in mind, you can live without fear of money of any kind, without that kind of fear. And that's what this new message series is all about. I'm calling it Living with Less in the Land of More. This whole series is based primarily on a book written by Dr. Gary Johnson entitled Too Much. It's, it's excellent stuff. 
But here's the thing, far too many of us, we struggle with the same problem. It's a real problem. Do you remember the words of Tom Hanks in the movie Apollo 13? Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> and if you're old enough, you can even remember watching that on TV when back in 1970, just two days into its mission to the moon, an oxygen supply tank exploded on board the uh, Apollo 13 spacecraft. And Captain James Lowell, he notified Mission Control that his crew had a life-threatening problem and the news spread quickly throughout the United States, it spread quickly around the world. If those three men aboard Apollo 13 were going to survive, immediate and drastic action needed to be taken by NASA and the crew. Everyone had to work together. And that's what they did. Those three men returned safely to Earth. Well, what is the problem we struggle with? It's the problem of more is never enough. That's the problem. And we need to answer the question, when is enough really enough? Because we have a problem. <laughs> and it's so serious that it's going to require all of us working together to find a solution. We have these exploding desires for more, and it's killing us. It's killing us financially. It's killing us spiritually. It's even killing us physically. An example of such a person is the late Howard Hughes. He was 70 years old when he died back in 1976. He always wanted more in life. He wanted more money, and he became one of the first multi-billionaires in America. He wanted more fame, so he broke into the Hollywood scene, and he became a filmmaker. He wanted more thrills, so he designed and built and flew some of the fastest aircraft in the world. All he ever wanted was more, and yet... When he came to the end of his life, he was reclusive and lonely. His body was emaciated and needle scarred from all of his heavy drug use. His teeth had rotted out. His fingernails were inches long and grotesquely misshapen. For Howard Hughes, more was never enough. You know, whenever it comes to problem solving, one of the first things you have to do is you have to identify what the real problem is. And the same thing is true of our financial problems. A lot of people, maybe even you, would say, well, that's easy. I'll tell you what my money problem is. I don't have enough money. <laughs> but I'm here to tell you, most of the time, that's not the problem. There are other things causing your money problems, and they're usually related to this myth of more, which says, I need more because what I have now is not enough, and more is never enough. And so we're going to look more closely at the money problem today and how we can go about solving that. First, the myth of more is a personal problem. You know, since the beginning of the time, people have struggled with this myth of more and that it's never enough. This isn't an isolated problem. It's not a little problem. It's not just a poor man's problem. Back 2,000 years ago, Jesus talked to a man whom we call the rich young ruler. We read about it in Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 23. Jesus invited the ruler to follow him, but the young man declined the invitation to do so because he wanted to hold on to his money. The Bible says he, the rich young ruler, went away sad because he had great wealth. He didn't want to give up on that and the pursuit of it. Jesus warned against buying into the myth of more when in Luke 12, verses 15 through 21, he says, Be on guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. And then following that warning, Jesus taught a parable about, a parable about a rich man who wanted to build bigger and better barns so that he could store more of his grain and more of his goods and more of his stuff. And at the end of the parable, Jesus calls this man a fool because his focus was only on himself, right? And he was going to die. Jesus wasn't suggesting that the man was being punished by God, but Jesus was simply pointing out that this guy had worked so hard all his life, right? And for what? He didn't care about any of the things that God cared about, and now someone else is going to enjoy what he worked so hard to amass. Talk about end-of-life regrets. You see, the real problem is 
that we don't recognize how much we already have. In fact, we don't even admit that we want and already have too much. Whether you're single or married, whether you're rich or poor, whether you're young or old, when will more be enough? At what point do we make enough money? How big do our homes or our apartments need to be to satisfy us? How many pairs of jeans or shoes are enough? Is it enough? Not only when our freezer and pantry is full of food, but our extra freezer and pantry is full of food as well. What about the books and the tools we buy? Wait, don't talk about the books. I like books. <laughs> In fact, Julie and I, we were just talking, I, I was telling her, I want, I want a house that has a big library in it. And she, she looks at me and she says, you're not going to get one of those Beauty and the Beast libraries. <laughs> you ever see Beauty and the Beast? He's walking that and I got a beautiful library. I guess I'm not getting that. But what about the trips we take? What about the cars we drive? When is enough really enough? You know, it's interesting how we're always comparing ourselves to others. But we look at our neighbors and we go, oh, look, they just got a new car. Oh, look, they're adding on to their house. Oh, oh, look at all their new toys. They just got a new 60-inch flat screen TV. Or maybe, if your world's different than my world, and instead of comparing yourself to your neighbor, you compare yourself to people like Warren Buffett and Bill Gates, you think to yourself, man, I need more. Look at all that they've got, right? And you just start feeling bad about that and, and thinking about how poor you are. This is when some perspective might be helpful. There's a website called globalrichlist.com. I put it in these sermon notes for you in that booklet. And you go to this website, and it gives you an idea of how wealthy you really are by comparing your income to people around the world. And it calculates where you are in terms of wealth compared to the rest of the world. So I got onto that website, and I discovered, for instance, that an American making $15,000 a year, we don't think that's very much, right, $15,000 a year, but they rank among the top 7.91% richest people in the world. In fact, it would take the average laborer in Indonesia 20 years to make that much money. A person making $30,000 a year is among the top 1.23% of richest people in the world. It would take that same average laborer in Indonesia 40 years to make that same amount of money. Do you make $50,000 a year? You are in the enviable position of being among the top 0.31%. That's, that's within, that's more than 1%, right? Within 1% of being amongst the top richest <coughs> people in the world. In fact, not only would it take the average laborer in Indonesia 67 years to make what you do, but your monthly income could pay the monthly salaries of 218 doctors in Azerbaijan. 218 doctors. Wow, that just kind of makes you stop and think, doesn't it? Get on that website, plug in your numbers, and you'll see where you rank amongst the world as far as wealth. America, this is what I'm saying here, America is the land of plenty where there are endless opportunities of having more. And here's the thing where we get into trouble. You know, younger people want immediately what their parents worked a lifetime to accumulate. And, but not only that, older Americans likewise want their kids to have a standard of living similar to theirs right out of the gate. And, and these desires are rooted in this myth of more. And it's real. It's a personal problem. But the myth of more is also a national problem. You know, governments at all levels are susceptible to massive debt because they're always wanting more. In recent years, this reality reared its ugly head, not only in the US, but all around the world. And it's reinforcing the myth of more, this attitude at the personal level. And I just think about that and I think, what if our governments set the example of living within their means? When we see entire governments head over heels in debt, to finance the purchase of more, you know what? It's real easy for us to start thinking that such behavior is normal and acceptable too. 
But I'm telling you, it's not. It's not. Don't do it. In 1 Timothy 6, 9 and 10, the Bible says this. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And some people eager for money, they have wandered from the faith and they've pierced, pierced themselves with many griefs. Do you remember all the bailouts of 2008? Wasn't that long ago. One corporate giant after another needed the government to, to bail them out of the financial pit they had dug for themselves. Congress, for instance, voted to bail out Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, and it cost Americans $200 billion. And I know it's really easy to think, oh, well, that's America. You know, we got that money. Who are Americans? You and me, right? Big banks received more than a combined $800 billion. That's billion with a B. Bear Stearns was given a financial bailout of $29 billion. The insurance giant AIG was rescued by the government, by us, at a cost of $85 billion. They got even more later on. The GM bailout cost us taxpayers $11.2 billion. Say it with me. Houston, we've got a problem. <laughs> People lost their houses to foreclosure. It was a nightmare. You could look up and down Swingle Street, which is the street that we live on, Julie and I and our family, and at one point you could see half a dozen houses that were for sale because of foreclosure. It was unheard of. People who had bought too much house on credit couldn't afford to make those payments later on down the road. It was a national epidemic. How did we get ourselves into such a mess? How is it that global corporations and internationally powerful banks went bankrupt? Well, a major newspaper in America hit the nail right on the head when it wrote this. America's brewing financial collapse has a common cause, a bankruptcy of values when it comes to money. Did you catch that? A bankruptcy of values when it comes to money. Wow. Everyone's crying, bail me out. You would have thought that we'd learn our lesson back in 2008 because of those financial problems, but we're still struggling when it comes to money as a nation. For instance, the United States Treasury, it continues to operate on borrowed funds as a nation. We're living way beyond our means, and we've done so for years. In fact, reports on the U.S. Treasury's website show that since 1960, Congress has proved an increase of our national debt ceiling 78 times. Now you know what that means, right? If you're increasing the debt ceiling, it means because Congress had previously said, we're not allowing ourselves to borrow more than this much money, but then they needed more money to pay the nation's bills, so they simply increased the amount so that they could borrow more and they went into even more debt. Now can you imagine doing that every time you maxed out your credit card? <laughs> you max out your credit card, but you want to borrow more anyway, and so you call up your credit card company and you just say, I know you set my previous credit limit at this, but I'm saying I need $20,000 more in credit, so I'm increasing it right now. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> That's what our government's doing. And we know that that kind of thing cannot keep working. There's a website called usdebtclock.org. They calculate our national debt. And as of October 29th at 1 p.m., that's yesterday afternoon, I got on that website, our nation was $19,803,451,225,755 in debt. Doesn't that make you proud to be an American? <laughs> And if we don't increase that debt ceiling every so often, our government will default on its expenses and obligations to pay things, such as Social Security and Medicare and military and government salaries. You wouldn't be able to get that tax fund that you're depending on. And here's my point. The real problem behind our debt, whether it's personal or national, is our desire for more. And folks, I didn't even mention the state and municipal governments that are crushed with debt because of living beyond their means. At one point not too long ago, California was issuing IOUs to its residents in lieu of checks because they had run out of money. Detroit's debt 
exceeded an estimated 18 to 20 billion dollars, causing them to be the largest city in history to declare bankruptcy. If our nation doesn't come to grips with uncontrolled spending, it will be our downfall. We have to admit that we're having a problem with money and the things that money can buy. We can admit that the real problem is we're always wanting more. The question is, can we get to the place in life where we say, I have too much and I want to live with less in the land of more. We've got a problem, but the good news is it can be solved. How? We must do what the Word says if we are to heal our financial problems. You've probably played the game Tug of War before. How many of you have ever played Tug of War? Okay, quite a few of you. You know, that's where two groups of people line up on opposite ends of a big long rope and their goal is to pull the other side across some point of no return. There might be a, a line down the middle, there might be a mud pit in the middle, and you're trying to pull the other side into that. When it comes to our finances, I get it. Often we're like in a big tug of war. At least I am. I'm in a tug of war with my finances too. You know, always kind of debating. Do I save up my money to buy something with cash, or do I buy it with credit and pay a little bit more because of the interest now? Or, or do I save? You know, do I save my money, or do I spend it all? Do I buy a new car, even though I haven't paid off the existing one I have yet? Do I give a full tithe to the local church, or just a portion of a tithe? Do we buy more house than we can afford, or not? Do I? Do I get another credit card so I can charge more? Or do I just pay off the one that I have? Too often, our financial health is sickly. Maybe it's even on life support because we are pulled in the wrong direction by evil desires within us. Now we know that we're making unsound financial decisions. We know that so often those decisions, they're not based on biblical principles. In 1 John 5, 3 we read, in fact, this is love for God to keep His commands. And His commands are not burdensome. So, there are principles of money and life management. And we're going to discuss those in the next month together. Principles like gratitude and contentment and trust and humility. And I think this is the perfect time of the year for a message series like this, Thanksgiving. And then following that, Christmas... Because these principles remind us that God really is very good to us. And life is about more than just all the stuff we buy and the possessions we own. We're also going to discuss practices that need to be applied if the principles of gratitude, contentment, trust, and humility are going to do us any good. Because in James 1.22, he says, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. And so for each of the next four weeks, we're going to look at a biblical principle for managing your money and your life. And based on each principle, we're going to discuss how you can put that into practice. Now, I know that churches sometimes get a bad reputation for always talking about money. Well, for one thing, we don't always talk about money. But for another thing, you're going to like hearing what the Bible has to say about money. You will. And if there are people in your life that you know of who are struggling with their finances right now and you love them, one of the most loving things you could do for them is to encourage them to come to church in November. And if you and they are serious about doing something for your finances that's positive and helpful, and you don't want to have to be scared of your financial situation anymore, Make sure you and they get to church. You can get even more insights about getting your financial life in order by joining with our life group that meets on Sunday evenings. In fact, we're only going to be meeting three times for life group on this subject, but I'm telling you, it's going to be good stuff. Now, I sometimes hear people complain, oh, why isn't God helping me to make ends meet so I can pay my bills? This is His fault. The answer to that? He is. 
But you have to avail yourself of his principles for financial success by making the effort to do things right. In Luke 17, 10 lepers came to Jesus and requested that he heal them. And Jesus told them to go and show themselves to the priests, and as they did so, they were healed. Jesus did his part. He healed them. But they also did their part. They obeyed him, and they went to the priests. Now, when we notice something that God wants us to know about, you and I, we have to make an effort to do what the Word says about that. And that's true when it comes to our money and our possessions and our life's priorities. Because there's a lot of voices out there clamoring for your time and life and money. But we need to make sure that we're listening to and abiding by the right message, right? Listen to the right voice, God's voice, and then do your part to make it so. Don't argue. Don't go, I know God, but... Do your part. Hear His principles and put them into practice. Ultimately, the only way you and I can take God's principles of gratitude, contentment, trust, and humility and add them to intentional practices is if we know His Word and we listen to His voice each and every day. That's what this next four weeks is going to be about. And I hope you'll make a commitment to be in here. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you for your life that comes through Jesus Christ our Lord. And God, we thank you that we do not have to go down the road of financial management blind and ignorant, but that we can just open up your word and, and see clearly certain principles and practices that people through the centuries have done to keep their financial lives on the right road and to make sure that they were honoring you with their life's priorities. And that's what my prayer is for each and every person here today and for our church as we go through this next month together, talking about living with less in the land of more. Help us to get that. Help us to lean into you more. We'll give you the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.